on the seventh and last day of the June 97 retreat in Springwater. We will read from various authors, as I've done in the past. There are always a few new additions and a few deletions. The only one complaint I ever received in all of these years was that for this person it was too much. <laughs> I never heard anyone else say that, so the pile still seems to be growing. <laughs> Please let me know afterwards if you feel it should be cut down. The way to listen to it is not to try to mull over it, but listen to it and let it go like the wind. We'll read, read first from Wang Po, a Chinese Zen teacher who lived about a thousand years ago. The book is, uh, the, his talks and dialogues are translated by John Blofeld. It's called The Zen Teaching of Wang Po on the Transmission of Mind. I'm not reading everything in a paragraph or sentence, I may leave some words out. It, this is not to give a reading on Wang Po, but to, to clarify what is so difficult to understand, and yet for some authors so easy to say. The Dialogues and talks were written down by Wang Po's disciple, who was a Buddhist scholar and also the governor of the province, where he saw to it that a monastery was built for Wang Po where he could teach. When Wang Po speaks about the Buddhas, he does not necessarily refer to the historical personage. Buddha means, in his language, an enlightened being. And when he speaks of one mind, he capitalizes both one and mind. He refers to what we yesterday were speaking about, the self with a capital S, or wholeness, or openness non-separation. The Master said to me, all the Buddhas and all sentient beings are nothing but the one mind beside which nothing exists. This mind which is without beginning is unborn and indestructible. It does not belong to the categories of things which exist or do not exist, nor can it be thought of in terms of young or old. It is neither long nor short, big nor small, for it transcends all limits, measures, names, traces, and comparisons. It is that which you see before you. Begin to reason about it, and you at once fall into error. It is like the boundless void which cannot be fathomed or me measured. The one mind alone is the Buddha, and there is no distinction between the Buddha and sentient beings, but that sentient beings are attached to forms and so seek externally for Buddhahood. By their very seeking, they lose it because it is using mind to grasp mind. Though they do their utmost for a full eon, they will not be able to attain to it. People do not know that if they put a stop to conceptual thought and forget their anxiety, the Buddha will appear before them. For this mind is Buddha, and Buddha is all living beings. 
It is not the less for being manifested in ordinary beings, nor is it greater for being manifested in the Buddhas. And later on, mind is like the void in which there is no confusion or evil, as when the sun wheels through it, shining upon the four corners of the world. For when the sun rises and illuminates the whole earth, the void gains not in brilliance. And when the sun sets, the void does not darken. The phenomena of light and dark alternate with each other, but the nature of the void remains unchanged. If you look upon the Buddha as presenting a pure, bright, or enlightened appearance, or upon sentient beings as presenting a foul, dark, or mortal-seeming appearance, these conceptions resulting from attachment to form will keep you from supreme understanding, even after the passing of as many eons as there are sands in the Ganges. There's only the one mind and not a particle of anything else on which to lay hold. Our original nature is in its highest truth devoid of any atom of objectivity. It is void, omnipresent, silent, pure. It is glorious and mysterious, peaceful joy, and that is all. Enter deeply into it by awakening to it yourself. That which is before you is it, in all its fullness utterly complete. There is naught beside it. Even if you go through all the stages of progress toward Buddhahood one by one, when at last in a flash you attain to realization, you will only be realizing the nature which has been with you all the time. And by all the foregoing stages, you will have added to it nothing at all. You will come to look upon those eons of work and achievement as no better than unreal actions performed in a dream. That is why the Buddha said, I truly attained nothing from complete unexcelled enlightenment. <clears throat> Questioner, from all you have said, mind is the Buddha. But it's not clear as to what sort of mind is meant by this mind which is the Buddha. Wang Po, how many minds have you got? Questioner, but is the Buddha the ordinary mind or the enlightened mind? Wang Po, where on earth do you keep your ordinary mind and your enlightened mind? Questioner. In the teaching of the sutras, it is stated that there are both. Why does your reverence deny it? Wang Po. In the teaching, it is clearly explained that the ordinary and enlightened minds are both illusions. You don't understand. All this clinging to the idea of things existing is to mis mistake vacuity for the truth. How can such, such conceptions not be illusory? If you would only rid yourselves of the concepts of ordinary and enlightened, you would find that there is no other Buddha than the Buddha in your own mind. You people go on misunderstanding. You hold to concepts such as ordinary and enlightened, directing your thoughts outwards where they gallop about like horses. All this amounts to the cloud your own minds. Though others may talk of the way of the Buddhas as something to be reached by various pious practices and by scripture study, you must have nothing to do with such ideas. A perception, sudden as blinking, that subject and object are one, 
will lead to a deeply mysterious, wordless understanding. And by this understanding, you will awake to the truth. Your true nature is something never lost to you, even in moments of delusion, nor is it gained at the moment of enlightenment. It depends on nothing and is attached to nothing. It is all-pervading, spotless beauty. It is the self-existent and uncreated absolute, absolute meaning dependent on nothing. Ah, it is a jewel beyond all price. When a sudden flash of thought occurs in your mind and you see it for a dream or an illusion, then you can enter into the state reached by the Buddhas of the past. Not that the Buddhas of the past really exist, or that the Buddhas of the future have not yet come into existence. Above all, have no longing to become a future Buddha. Your sole concern should be, as thought mm. succeeds thought, to avoid clinging to any of them. Two short passages taken from a booklet <clears throat> compiled for the annual gathering of the Krishnamurti Foundation in India. One is from the Star Bulletin in 1932. The individual problem is the world problem. If the individual has found happiness, has created order within himself, then he will create order in the world around him. And in helping others to solve their own individual problems, he will help to solve the world problem. You think that in seeking the liberation of the self, there is a suggestion of egotism. You think that to be eternally happy is a selfish realization. You think that to be free from sorrow and strife is a desertion of the world. This is a misconception. Liberation is the very antithesis of the sense of the ego, of I-ness. It is the ultimate realization for all people. And in 1940, from a talk at Ojai, I personally feel that the world is myself, that what I do creates either peace or sorrow in the world that is myself. And as long as I do not understand myself, I cannot bring peace to the world. So my immediate concern is myself, not selfishly, not merely to alter myself in order to gain greater happiness, greater sensations, greater successes. For as long as I do not understand myself, I must live in pain and sorrow and cannot discover an enduring peace and happiness. Two selections from The Meditative Mind, selection of passages for the study of the teachings of Krishnamurti, brought out by the foundation in Ojai, California. This selection is from The Flame of Attention. It is immensely important to know and to understand the depth and beauty of meditation. Man has always been asking from timeless time whether there is something beyond all thought, beyond all romantic inventions, beyond all time. He's always been asking, is there something beyond all this suffering, 
beyond all this chaos, beyond wars, beyond the battle between human beings? Is there something that is immovable, sacred, utterly pure, untouched by thought, by any experience? This has been the inquiry of serious people from the ancient of days. <coughs> to find that out, to come upon it, meditation is necessary. Not the repetitive meditation that is utterly meaningless. There is a creative energy which is truly religious when the mind is free from all conflict, from the travail of thought. To come upon that which has no beginning, no end, that is the real depth of meditation and the beauty of it. There is complete security in compassionate intelligence, total security. But we want security in ideas, in beliefs, in concepts, in people, in ideals. We hold on to them, they are our security, however false, however irrational. Where there is compassion with its supreme intelligence, there is security from, if one is seeking security. Actually, where there is compassion, where there is that intelligence, there is no question of security. So there is an origin, an original ground from which all things arise, and that original ground is not the word. The word is never the thing. And meditation is to come upon that ground which is the origin of all things and which is free from all time. chapter from I Am That by Nisargadatta it was almost contemporary to Krishnamurti. He lived in India. He never traveled. Died in the 80s and was in his 80s. Translated by Maurice Friedman. Questioner. Maharaj, you're sitting in front of me and I am here at your feet. What is the basic difference between us? Nisagadatta? There is no basic difference. Questioner. Still, there must be some real difference. I come to you, you do not come to me. Nisargadatta, because you imagine differences, you go here and there in search of superior people. Questioner, you too are a superior person. You claim to know the real while I do not. Nisargadatta, did I ever tell you that you do not know and therefore you are inferior? Let those who invented such distinctions prove them. I do not claim to know what you do not. In fact, I know much less than you do. Questioner. Your words are wise, your behavior noble, your grace all-powerful. Nisagadatta. I know nothing about it all and see no difference between you and me. My life is a succession of events just like yours. Only I am detached and see the passing show as a passing show, while you stick to things and move along with them. Questioner. What made you so dispassionate? Nisagadatta. Nothing in particular. It so happened that I trusted my guru. He told me I'm nothing but myself, 
and I believed him. Trusting him, I behaved accordingly and ceased caring for what was not me, not mine. The self here again with a capital S. Questioner, why were you so lucky to trust your teacher fully while our trust is nominal and verbal? Nisargadatta, who can say? It happened so. Things happen without cause and reason, and after all, what does it matter who is who? Your high opinion of me is your opinion only. You can change at any moment. Why attach importance to opinions, even your own? Questioner, still you are different. Your mind seems to be always quiet and happy, and miracles happen around you. Nisargadatta, I know nothing about miracles, and I wonder whether nature admits exceptions to her laws, unless we agree that everything is a miracle. As to my mind, there is no such thing. There is consciousness in which everything happens. It is quite obvious and within experience of everybody. You just do not look carefully enough. Look well and see what I see. Questioner, what do you see? Nisargadatta, I see what you too could see, here and now, but for the wrong focus of your attention. You give no attention to yourself. Your mind is all with things, people, and ideas, never with yourself. Bring yourself into focus. Become aware of your own existence. See how you function. Watch the motives and the results of your actions. Study the prison you have built around yourself by inadvertence, by knowing what you are not you come to know yourself. One thing is certain, the real is not imaginary, it is not a product of the mind. Once you are convinced that you cannot say truthfully about yourself anything except I am, and that nothing that can be pointed at can be yourself, you are no longer intent on verbalizing what you are. All you need is to get rid of the tendency to define yourself. All definitions apply to your body only and to its expressions. Once this obsession with the body and its expressions goes, you will revert to your natural state spontaneously and effortlessly. The only difference between us is that I am aware of my natural state while you are bemused. Just like gold made into ornaments has no advantage over gold dust, except when the mind makes it so, so are we one in being. We differ only in appearance. We discover this by being earnest, by searching, inquiring, questioning daily and hourly, by giving one's life to this discovery. From the teaching of Vimalataka, she lives in India, she used to travel all over the world, now she's located in Dalhousie and Mount Abu. And these are talks transcribed that took place at Dalhousie in India during the summer of 89. The book is called Being and Becoming. We are talking about an alternative way of living, which is a meditative way of living. 
acquire knowledge, let it flow through you, let it be utilized in its relevant field without thought creating a knower. If we look at the roots of all human misery, we will find that misery is built upon our stupefaction. We do not know how to relate to the social structures and use them without identification, without creating a sense of authority out of them. Structures are not sacred. It is only life that is sacred. Patterns have no sacredness, whether you create them in the name of religion, <coughs> spirituality, or politics. It is the pattern-free, structure-free, virgin dynamism of life that is sacred, that is divine. Wherever you have touched it with thought, you have manipulated it, you have structured it. It has a utility, but not sanctity. It has a utility, but no authority. Knowledge itself has no power to bind you. It is the creation of the knower, or the me that knows, that is the obstacle. You have a beautiful, sensitive body, and the sensitivity gets in touch with its respective objects outside, and they bring sensations. Sensations are converted back to electric impulses, and the brain interprets them. It is a marvelous process of what you call experiencing contact with the outside world through the senses, which are very delicate, very tender. It is quite hard and arduous work to keep your sensual system pure, healthy, supple, and elastic. Let the experiences flow through the sensual system. Nothing wrong in a sensual, sexual experience, but you create an experiencer, or thought creates the experiencer, and gets stuck in the experience, and its likes and dislikes, its value structures, preferences, prejudices. If the sensual contact with objects is allowed to flow through you without creating an experiencer, then the limited human-made world cannot corrupt you. As the oneness of life manifesting itself into manyness does not get corrupted, does not lose its vitality, does not get mutilated, the oneness of life manifesting into manyness does not get corrupted. In the same way, you acquire knowledge and you appear as an individual playing the role of a father, a mother, a brother, sister, a son, you are one appear appearing as many. There's no identification with the fatherness, the sonness, daughterness, sisterness, and you don't tie so many knots inside, but play the role sanely, completely, with the magnificence of an inner equipoise then your appearing as many shall not corrupt you. Meditation is an alternative way of living. You have to use language, you have to use symbols. All these norms and criteria are the measurements. I'll leave this out. The word meditation has been identified with psychophysical exercises, with concentrations, with methods, techniques, kundalini, shakti paths. The word has been abused and misused. No authority and no effort. Freedom from authority and freedom from the struggle of efforts. Once you know that these human-made enclosures are only to be lived in, then the sense of comparing yourself with others, he has a palace and I have a hut, he has millions and I have hundreds, the sense of comparison and the ambition for competition disappears. Your economic life 
becomes simple. No vanity, no pride about your scholarship, your erudition, and your social life becomes simple. You do not move around with a begging bowl for sympathy, for acceptance, prestige, acknowledgement. Can you see with me that effortlessness is the content of silence? Silence is not only sitting still, it is a way of living. Silence is inner unconditional freedom from the authority of the past. Meditation has no repetition at all. It is moment to moment. In the moment of relating, you are living. In the moment of aloneness, you are dying. It is living and dying, like inhaling and exhaling. To be alone is to die to the sense of being somebody or being something. Is not that the content of death and dying? To be alone is to die to the sense of being somebody, sinner or saint, holy, knowledgeable, respectable, rich or poor. To be alone is to die to being something according to the definition of society, according to the value structure of religion. Physically isolating yourself may not lead you to the aloneness. It may, it may not. That is what we are afraid of, dying to the sense of being somebody, dying to all the images that you have built up about yourself as being alone. The way we are tackling the theme may be unusual, unheard of to many. It is a non-conventional way, a non-traditional approach. But I'm really grateful that life brings you and me together. Some poems from an anthology, The Enlightened Heart, edited by Stephen Mitchell. This one is by Li Po, 701 to 762, a mountain hermit. You ask why I make my home in the mountain forest, and I smile, and am silent, and even my soul remains quiet. It lives in the other world which no one owns. The peach trees blossom, the water flows. Another one by Lipo. The birds have vanished into the sky, and now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. This one is by Le Men Pang, 740 to 808. When the mind is at peace, the world too is at peace. Nothing real, nothing absent. Not holding on to reality, 
not getting stuck in the void. You are neither holy nor wise, just an ordinary fellow who has completed his work. And another one by Lehman Pong. <clears throat> My daily affairs are quite ordinary, but I'm in total harmony with them. I don't hold on to anything, don't reject anything. Nowhere an obstacle or conflict. Who cares about wealth and honor? Even the poorest thing shines. My miraculous power in spiritual activity, drawing water and carrying wood. Izumi Shikibu, 997, 2034. Watching the moon at dawn, solitary, mid-sky, I knew myself completely, no part left out. Rumi, about a thousand years ago, I think. What's time? doesn't matter. Eight hundred years ago. I have lived on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons knocking on a door. It opens. I've been knocking from the inside. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other don't make any sense. Still roomy. Outside the freezing desert night, this other night inside grows warm, kindling. Let the landscape be covered with thorny crust. We have a soft garden in here. The continents blasted, cities and little towns, everything becomes a scorched, blackened ball. The news we hear is full of grief for that future. But the real news inside here is, there's no news at all. The first day of spring, spring, this is Rokan, Japanese hermit monk, 1758 to 1831. The first days of spring, the sky is bright blue, the sun huge and warm. Everything is turning green. Carrying my monk's bowl, I walk to the village to beg for my daily meal. The children spot me at the temple gate and happily crowd around, dragging at my arms till I stop. I put my bowl on a white rock, hang my bag on a branch. First we braid grasses and play tug of war. Then we take turns singing and keeping a kickball in the air. I kick the ball and they sing. 
They kick the ball and I sing. Time is forgotten, the hours fly. People passing by point at me and laugh. Why are you acting like such a fool? I nod my head and don't answer. I could say something, but why? Do you want to know what's in my heart? From the beginning of time, just this, just this. In all ten directions of the universe, there's only one truth. When we see clearly, the great teachings are the same. What can ever be lost? What can be attained? If we attain something, it was there from the beginning of time. If we lose something, it is hiding somewhere near us. Look, this ball in my pocket, can you see how priceless it is? And a few more Ryokan poems from One Robe, One Bow. An evening dream. Everything must have been an illusion. I cannot explain clearly even one part of what I saw. Yet in the dream it seemed as if the truth were in front of my eyes. This morning, awake, is it not the same dream? A thief has stolen my zafu and futan, cushion and mat. Why did he break into my hermitage? The door is never locked. The night is ending and I sit alone by the window. A sparse rain falls gently against the bamboo grove. The thief left it behind. The moon at the window. Here's one by Wendell Berry, The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake nests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water. And I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Few poems by Mary Oliver, contemporary poet. This one is from White Pine. Title is Work. How beautiful this morning was pasture pond. 
It had lain in the dark all night, catching the rain on its broad back. All day I work with the linen of words and the pins of punctuation. All day I hang out over a desk, grinding my teeth, staring. Then I sleep. Then I come out of the house, even before the sun is up, and walk back through the pine woods to pass Chopin. This one is from, these a few selections from House of Light, Mary Oliver. It's called The Kingfisher, that's a bird. The kingfisher rises out of the black wave like a blue flower. In his beak, he carries a silver leaf. I think this is the prettiest world so long as you don't mind a little dying, how could there be a day in your whole life that doesn't have its splash of happiness? There are more fish than there are leaves on a thousand trees. And anyway, the kingfisher wasn't born to think about it or anything else. When the wave snaps shut over his blue head, the water remains water. Hunger is the only story he has ever heard in his life that he could believe. I don't say he's right. Neither do I say he's wrong. Religiously, he swallows the silver leaf with its broken red river. And with a rough, rough and easy cry, I couldn't rouse out of my thoughtful body if my life depended on it, he swings back over the bright sea to do the same thing, to do it as I long to do something, anything, perfectly. This one is called Indonesia. <laughs> On the curving, dusty roads we drove through the plantations where the pickers balanced on the hot hillsides. Then we climbed toward the green trees, toward the white scarves of the clouds, to the inn that is never closed in this land of fairest weather. The sun hung like a stone, time dripped away like a steaming river, and from somewhere a dry tongue lashed out its single motto, now and forever. And the pickers balanced on the hot hillsides like gray and blue blossoms, wrapped in their heavy layers of clothes against the whips of the branches in that world of leaves no poor man with a brown face and an empty sack has ever picked his way out of. At the inn, we stepped from the car to the garden, where tea was brought to us, scalding in white cups from the fire. Don't ask if it was the fire of honey or the fire of death. Don't ask if we were determined to live at last with merciful hearts. We sat among the unforgettable flowers. We let the white cups cool before we raised them to our lips.
the notebook. 6 a.m. The small pond turtle lifts its head into the air like a green toe. It looks around. What it sees is the whole world swirling back from darkness, a red sun rising over the water, over the pines, and the wind lifting, and the water striders heading out, and the white lilies opening their happy bodies. The turtle doesn't have a word for any of it. The silky water or the enormous blue morning or the curious affair of its own body. On the shore, I am so busy scribbling and crossing out, I almost miss seeing him paddle away through the wet black forest. More and more the moments come to me. How much can the right word do? Now a few of the lilies are a faint flamingo inside their white hearts. And there is still time to let the last roses of the sunrise float down into my uplifted eyes. And our last selection from New and Selected Poems by Mary Oliver, The Sun. Have you ever seen anything in your life more wonderful than the way the sun, every evening, relaxed and easy, floats toward the horizon and into the clouds or the hills or the rumpled sea and is gone. And how it slides again out of the blackness every morning on the other side of the world like a red flower streaming upward on its heavenly oils. Say, on a morning in early summer at its perfect imperial distance and have you ever felt for anything such wild love? Do you think there's anywhere in any language a word billowing enough for the pleasure that fills you as the sun reaches out, as it warms you, as you stand there, empty-handed? Or have you, too, turned from this world? Or have you, too, gone crazy for power, for things? We will end here for today.